Levi Stoll is now the marketing director of the University of Chicago Press. As of about six weeks ago. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. And as of about 10 years ago, we got together to talk about your previous role. I was a promotions director and publicity manager there for a long time, and we talked about publicity and, and how you get the word out about books. Um, and now, in theory, I can talk about being a marketing director and what that role is, but I should preface it with, you know, that I've got about six weeks under my belt, so who yeah, knows. Okay. But you've, you've also been close to the marketing function for yeah. most of your professional career. Yeah, my old boss, Carol Casper, retired this fall after 37 years there. Um, she had been marketing director since 95, and I have worked for her in the marketing department since 99. So it's, it's been a while, and I've done a variety of jobs in the marketing department, including, like I said, publicity, but before that, some advertising, um, and I had worked in our direct mail department and way back when I was a bookseller. So I have at least some sense of most of what our group does or should be doing, Great. although there's certainly still plenty I'm going to be learning. Well, let's start off with uh, what a book marketer does. The book marketer creates awareness for a specific book among booksellers and consumers with the goal of selling books. Yeah, that's a pretty straightforward definition. Like when I'm interviewing people for a job, for example, I tend to put it in terms of the structure of how a book happens. You know, there are departments at the press that are responsible for finding books for us, the acquisitions department, and signing them up. There's the editing and production department and design who make the books. And then our job is everything from the point the book exists to getting it onto your bookshelf. And obviously some of our work starts a little before it exists. And some of the places it ends up aren't necessarily your bookshelf, but are other places. But that's the broad version. Our job is to make sure that the books we sign up get out into the world and people find out about them and buy them. So you help the sales department to get books in front of bookstore buyers. Right. So how do you do that? Yeah. So the we have a sales the sales department uh, uh, reports to me as well. They're all we're all together in the same marketing department. In some presses they're they're divided up, but in in ours and I think it makes sense structurally because our job does involve both getting the books out there and then getting them bought by consumers. So linking up those two things makes sense. Um, so our sales department basically does it in some sense the old-fashioned way. They can they go out and they call on stores. That can take very different forms um, depending on the store and the kind of books we're presenting and the books they sell. It's everything from visiting the little store around the corner here and showcasing a handful of books on Chicago because that's the kind of thing from us they can sell. And that a call like that from our Midwest sales rep might take half an hour, you know, a couple hours of prep beforehand, some back and forth via email, but the actual sit down might be pretty quick and it's going through and saying, okay, I think you guys could sell these books and I, yeah, I would suggest you take three or five of each of them. And then there's some back and forth with the store. And, you know, a good sales rep will once in a while land something there that the, that the owner wouldn't have noticed or wouldn't have thought they could do well with and they'll make a case for why that works. And so what time of the year would that call take place? It happens twice a year for us. Generally, American publishing is still on a, tw a two seasons a year schedule. Some people go a little more to three, and there, there's certainly a slow movement toward a rolling process. But right now, we're still spring and fall, basically. Okay. And so our sales reps hit the road in January. And once the stores are done with Christmas, they don't want to see anybody before that. <laughs> um, and then again, in, in the summer, usually starting in June. And they will just make the circuit. Um, and again, they'll go, it's all kinds of stores and all kinds of types of call. You'll have calls for bigger stores where you, where the sales rep is there for two full days almost. Our sales like rep, which ones, for example? Like something like, for example, you might at a place like Elliott Bay Books in, in Seattle. Seattle. Yeah. Um, we have a ton of books for them, and our sales reps handle Chicago, but they also rep for, on commission, some smaller publishers, other university presses. So they'll have a whole bag of publishers that they're working with, and they will present... The idea is to present every book that you think that Elliott Bay would have a shot at selling. And, and why do they? Why would they be so interested in so many of your books as opposed to Random House, for example? That's the case our, we and our reps have to make, basically. is Part of the reason I enjoy being in marketing as opposed to one of the other departments is it is very clear that we're out there competing with everybody. We're To some extent, when we're making decisions about what we're going to publish or when we're gauging our success overall, 
we're generally looking to our peer publishers, places like Harvard and Princeton and Yale in California. But when we're actually out there in the bookstore, when we're out there making publicity calls on media, what we're competing with is Penguin Random House. We're competing with Norton and FSG. They don't really care who the publisher no. is. They care about the content of the book and yeah. who wrote it. And so the with the sales reps and bookstores, what they need to do is convince the stores that... And, and we have things going for us in this regard. Um, there's a base level of quality that our books are never mm-hmm. going to be bad. That we the books that, they, that the sales reps convince the stores to take in will be supported by successful marketing, that that there's a strong publicity team behind them, that that if the store takes the book in, the customers will hear about it somewhere and come looking for it. Okay, and that's basically what we want to talk about today. Yeah, yeah. so the way all those things work together is kind of how our the marketing department works. And okay. So, and then the other thing I think, the way that the sales reps, and I know this from my days as a bookseller too, you convince stores to take in a book partly because you've got a long relationship with them. Mm-hmm. Um, not that they're doing you a favor, although occasionally they will if, and, and vice versa, um, but more that you've, they know that you know their store and that what they can sell and what their customers will buy and that you're being straight with them. A sales rep always wants to put the best face on a book, yeah. but you also know that in, to some degree, this relationship with a store, if you've built a good relationship is ultimately at least as important, if not more so, than any individual book. You'd rather be honest and preserve the relationship than get book X in. You don't want to sell them a bunch of books that they're not going to sell, right? It's not going to be good for anybody. And so making it so that the stores understand that you're there to help them as a sales rep um, is a big part of getting them to trust your take on a book and your judgment and to take it in. And why does Elliot Bay, is it? Yeah. Why do they particularly take so many of your books? Um, there, there's a number of stores like that. You think of something like, or also Seminary Co-op in Chicago, or um, Book Culture in New York, Labyrinth in Princeton, where they just they they believe in having a breadth and depth of stock, okay. and in moving beyond uh, beyond your basic bestsellers. Uh, and I feel bad now because I'm sure I'm leaving out a bunch of stores that I should should mention. <laughs> Uh, I love you all stores. You're all great. Um, but, but there, you know, you go, there's some stores you go in and it's clear that they, they either because they have limited space or because their clientele is more of a, a, what we used to call a carriage trade, more of just stopping in on the way home to pick up the, the book they heard about on NPR. Uh, they're more limited in what they're going to carry. Yeah. Whereas you go to something like the seminary co-op or McNally Jackson and you see a store that, while certainly, and especially with, with McDonald Jackson's a good example in New York, with they're they're definitely careful about what they stock. They're clear on what they think they can sell, and they will certainly sell you the latest bestseller. They will have no problem doing that, and it will be there stacked up. But they also think that their you know their fiction section, for example, shouldn't be all books from the past decade, or it shouldn't be all books from major publishers. Um, their history section should have some more nuance and breadth to it. And it's so it's with stores like that that a, a good university press can really do well because they're stores that understand the value that we bring. And what is that value? Um, it's a couple of things, I think. It's, it's on the, when it comes to new books, again, it's kind of a level of seriousness and engagement that with a subject that we like to think at least goes beyond what you're going to get from most, say, contemporary trade history. Um, and, and that they'll have customers who will value that. So it's, it's serious academic research? Um, it's, I think, a combination. It's, it's bringing, in some ways, I think it's bringing nuance to a topic that I think often, whatever the topic, often might be treated more, more broadly and more glancingly in the general media or in, in uh, more high-profile books. So it drills deeper in yeah. certain areas than that might not be... I think our recent Thoreau biography by Laura Dassel Walls that was published last year is a really good example of what a university press can do at its best that is different because it was a, a straight on biography, birth to death, and it was like all the biographies, what you wanted. It told all the major stories of his life. It told where he was, what he did each time, the people he knew. But because Laura Walls has spent her life working on Thoreau, 
it also really engaged deeply with his thought in a way that was accessible to, to a general reader. If you were someone who had just read Walden, you could dig into this book and learn so much more mm. without ever feeling at, at sea or like you needed had needed to prep or take a course beforehand. She just walked you carefully through it without, at the same time, without leveling off or, or dumbing down his philosophy in a way that I think a good biography from any publisher ought to do that. But it was something that I, 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 you could count on us to do in the context of this because the whole point of a biography of Thoreau isn't just that he was an interesting person, but it is that he was a thinker. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. So something like that, I think, is the kind of thing a university press brings. Plus the fact is that there are quite a range of biographies in the marketplace already. So this, uh, you'd want this to sort of dig new ground. Yeah, and I think that's, that's maybe another way to think about what university presses offer is it's pretty rare that we as a group will publish something that's been done before. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure, I'm sure you could point out things on our own backlist that, that gently rework ground that's been covered. But, but usually it is partly because of the peer review process where every book we publish, and the same is true for our, our fellow presses, is approved by a board. It's, it's gone over by outside readers who are specialists in the field to make sure it's actually good, and it's approved by our board of university publications which is made up of faculty, the book needs to be offering something intellectually. Uh, it, it's not enough to say, oh yeah, we can sell this. It needs to be actually doing something that's new and different and, mm -hmm. and you can, where you can say this makes a contribution. And that field might be something very popular, but it's, it needs to be actually kind of pushing it forward or, or showing you a new way to look at it. Okay. So we talked about the, the, the sales rep going into the, the bookstore buyer. So what does the marketing department provide that sales rep with that he or she can use to convince the buyer? So much stuff. We provide so much <laughs> stuff. It's, it's fun because I, I love working with sales reps. They're just voracious consumers of information. And I have experience from the other side of uh, being sold to in bookstores when I was a bookseller. And I, so I know what all that information turns into, which is a very short pitch generally. Yeah. But it's a pitch that's backed up by the ability to answer questions, to follow up, to, to dig deeper if a buyer wants to know more. And that knowledge is rooted in all the information that we give them and work with them on at sales conference and beyond. So it is descriptions in the seasonal catalog that they go out with. It's... Uh, shorter descriptions that give a slightly different take on them that might be might do a little more putting it in context of other books or in, of the marketplace and of what other books have sold. Um, I write one-liners for every book in our catalog that are just exactly what they sound like, just a, a one-line thumbnail pitch for a book that helps the reps when they're getting, especially when they're getting deeper into the more specialized section and books that most stores they see probably aren't going to take. It'll give them something to work with if a store asks about a book. They'll have that at their command, at least. And then we we give them galleys, advanced uncorrected page proofs to look through for themselves and to share with stores. We give them often manuscripts or like an, the introduction or a forward to a book so they can have a sense of, of that. We'll give for illustrated books. We'll supply as many images as we, as we can because stores want to have a sense of what those are going to look like and, and be like. Where possible for illustrated books, we'll give them finished copies. Uh, sometimes you'll be able to have, you, you'll have books well in advance and able to just basically sit on them, release them in a couple months to the stores, but for now let the reps go out and, and actually show this bookseller, this is what this one's going to look like. Don't you want to stack this up? So it'll have a pretty close replica of the, what the cover is going yeah. to look like. It's, it's actually an advance. Yes, exactly. Cop, and and cop, we, yeah, we can't always do that, but sometimes with illustrated books, because their production times are so long, you can time it so that you, you're working ahead and can do that. And that really helps. Mm -hmm. um, and then in the course of sales conference and through interactions before and after, we'll also just answer a lot of questions. The, the reps are really good at figuring out where the holes might be in the way you've presented a book to them because they're so used to sitting down with somebody who doesn't know the book and ask, taking questions. Mm -hmm. And so they will often come back needing to know more about this or that. Uh, there's also very simple things, like nearly all of our books are published by university faculty of one kind or another. And 
just making sure they know where those people are teaching because the bookstore there is going to want to stock it. If it's something like a Barnes & Noble campus store, that is the way you get the book in there is by, you know, they, they're, they're generally facing a lot of pressure to have t-shirts and course books and things. And so to get a book into their course, into their regular stock, it really helps to be able to tell them, hey, this person teaches here, you know, it, they will appreciate seeing the book there and they'll send their friends and colleagues to get it. And also the fact that that, that professor may have had previous successes and won various awards, etc. Yeah, and that actually gets to another thing with the, our sales reps are very much content people by nature. They're, they're about what a book is about, but they also work really closely with the numbers. They'll, you know, a big part of what they do is showing stores, okay, here's what, here's the book that we think is most comparable to that one, either from us or from somebody else. And here's what the sales were. And nowadays the stores can very easily look like they'll look up, okay, well, we sold 35 of that one. Mm -hmm. So that's a good sign. You know, we'll take 20 to start of this. And being able to be fluid and conversant in both that, the numbers side of things and the content side is a big part of being a sales rep today. Anything else that you as the marketing department provide the sales rep with? Um, the, the next part of it would be we kind of throughout the season as books are being published, as we're working ahead on the publicity side, sending out advanced galleys to media, making calls on media to pitch books, we'll just feed the reps a continuous stream of information about what we're hearing. So for example, I did a round of calls in my old role a couple weeks ago in New York, seeing the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and the New Yorker. Physically, yeah. you, you went in and... Stopped, stopped in and, and spent time with editors at all those places, presenting things that, that seem right for their readers. Mm -hmm. And the nice thing about this is I've been doing that for a long time, and so most of these are very comfortable, friendly meetings where it's part of it is just getting back together with people you know and, and finding out what they've been seeing and reading and, and been excited about. But then also certainly leaving them a stack of galleys and explaining, you know, these are the, the six I'm super excited about and here's why. Here's the one you might not have noticed that I think actually you really should take a look at. And but again, that sounds like very much a, a selling process to the media as yeah. opposed to the book buyer. And the difference, one difference there is, and it's a distinct difference, with the sales rep, there is a commercial proposition on offer. It's mm -hmm. it's. I'm here to help you make money and then we will make money as well. It's usually less raw than that because we're a university press, but it's it's the fundamental part of it is it's business. With the publicity side, it's, it's not transactional in the same way. They don't get anything explicit out of this. Other what, than interesting content. Yes, exactly. Yeah. What, what our role there is to do is to make their job of finding good content for their readers easier. Yeah. And if we're doing it well then they appreciate that and they get something out of these meetings. Okay. If we aren't, if we're presenting the wrong books, if we're not really taking into account what their readership is like, uh, then we're not helping them at all. And eventually they'll stop meeting with you. So, so we'll come out of those meetings with some sense of what, how the books are being received. And then over the course of the next few months as publication nears, we'll be able to tell the reps hey, I'm expecting the New York Times on this, or we're going to get some you know, national NPR for this, I think. Mm. And then they can use that to work with their store accounts. To say, look what we're doing to promote yeah, this book. Exactly. Hey, if you, if you, you might want some. a few more than, than you were going right. to take. Or the, you were on the fence about this one, but now I've got good news. You might go ahead and take it in. But that's publicity. That's yeah. not marketing. So it all comes under the marketing umbrella. Okay. Yeah. It's, I think, the way the easiest way to divide it up in, under there is that you've got your sales group who are selling books to the stores, publicity who are looking for free media, or I think what they call in the political side, earned media. Earned um, media, okay. And then we've got advertising, which is paid media. And How much of that do you do? We do a, a, quite a bit, certainly not as much as we did years ago, as is the case, I think, with most publishers. Advertising for books, as I think I heard the CEO, I think, of Macmillan say one time, it's a very expensive proposition, partly because of the price point of books. You have, like, if you're if you're advertising a Mercedes, you don't have to sell that many more from your New Yorker ad to make it worthwhile. Whereas with books, you have to move a lot of units to make it even close to break even. Gen you, you know what I've heard? Sorry, is that it's it's author facing rather than 
consumer facing. It's like, look what we're doing for our authors here. You mm -hmm. might want to consider having your next book published by us. And I think you, you definitely get hints of that. And I shouldn't speak with authority because I've never worked at a trade publisher. Mm -hmm. But you'll see a, a, like a full page ad in the Wall Street Journal for a, a big, let's just say for Stephen King or whatever. And you you can't help but look at that and think, right, this is this is Scribner saying, hey, we appreciate you, rather than anything else. Yeah, it's a it's... business decision of a different sort. Um, but there is a there is definitely value there for a publisher because it gets your name out there. Uh, and for a university press, I think in particular, it can be a good reminder to your authors, to agents, to your uh, even just your university itself. Hey, we're out there. We're doing interesting books. Here's a a look at this range of, of interesting titles that are aimed at general readers while still being serious. There's definitely value to it mm -hmm. that can't necessarily be quantified in, oh, we sold X more units. Where um, do you advertise primarily? I mean, it varies book to book, of course, but where where do you advertise the most? Like a lot of university presses, the New York Review of Books has long been a, a key place for us. Uh, that's a readership that we certainly value and that, that reads our books and buys our books and is nicely self-selecting as a, if you're a reader of the New York Review of Books, you are a reader, period, and that's a great starting point for us. Um, but places like the TLS and the London Review of Books as well, similarly, these are among your both your most hardcore readers and your most serious readers. Yeah. And that's kind of the heart of our demographic. Okay. Um, but we also will advertise different books in different places. We do a fair amount of science and we'll advertise with places like American Scientist. Uh, we will advertise political books with places like The Nation or The New Republic. It, it depends a little bit on the list and the season. The, so you, for example, wouldn't do what... Faber just did after they won the Booker. They took out uh, outdoor advertising. They did some buses, subways, that kind of stuff. It, would you? You would never do that. I it, don't imagine. If we won the Booker, who knows? <laughs> but yeah. um, it's funny, actually. In the UK, you do see a lot more tube ads and more outdoor ads for books than I see anywhere here. Like mm. I can't think of a time I've seen a billboard for a book no no and in the in the uk you see them all the time you do it's it's a lovely to see it too i i was in the tube uh, this was a, some years ago and i saw an ishiguro title and it was it was beautiful yeah. it it's remarkable that that to me as an outsider that that is a standard thing for the trade publishers in the uk and yeah. and it is it's it makes your excuse me your commute uh, more visually interesting than it would be if those were just vodka ads yeah Anyway, sorry, I interrupted. Uh, but yeah, it's hard to imagine in our context deciding to do something like that. But if you if you won a, a prestigious award, I imagine you would do some work around yeah, it. Yeah, like if we were to win a National Book Award, you know, that is a moment where you you call a meeting and you sit together and you figure out what you do next for this book. Because I mean, it's already got some early legs, yeah. you just want to boost right. that. You want to make sure you, you take advantage of this opportunity that's been given to you. Yeah. And, you know, with something like the National Book Award or the Pulitzer, uh, which we've won for poetry before, both of those, mm -hmm. uh, the award itself does most of the work. It's always yeah. it's really interesting with the very top tier awards to see what that means for a book in terms of suddenly it's being mentioned in even the second, third, fourth tier papers in the United States because it goes out over the wire. It's being talked about on the morning shows and places that generally your book's coverage is pretty minimal. And certainly your coverage of serious books is almost nil. And so to see that in action is, is really interesting. And then to see the effect on sales, it, it's fun. Mm -hmm. That said, you don't tend to win those awards very often. So no, no. It, it's not something you can count on. One of your roles then is to make sure that books uh, are available displayed and promoted to the public. Yeah, and that's actually a more complicated job than it was years ago. Complicated in ways that are good overall, but we now have so many options available to us for managing inventory and for making sure that books stay in stock and that they're available whenever there's... If you get a big publicity break or if, you, if there's a reason suddenly the demand spikes for a book... Mm. For most books, you've got a lot of options for quickly getting more. 
like yeah. print on like demand. Print on demand. So you use a bit of that? Yeah, we do. And I, these days, pretty much every publisher makes vast use of a variety of options. Mm-hmm. For your standard paperback, it's all but seamless now, barring surprises. You can just count on always having inventory. And that's a, such a welcome change from even just 10 years ago. Hardcovers, it's still a little bit less straightforward, but it's possible and it's getting easier all the time. So again, short and turnaround. Short, you can do something where you can do small print runs, you can do pr- true print on demand, and the quality gets better all the time so that we're really reaching a point where you'll be able to keep regular old books, not talking coffee table books or art books, mm. in stock without any issues kind of all the time. Uh, that said, this year has been really interesting and not in a good way in that there, in the past couple of weeks, there have finally been a couple of stories covering a problem that we publishers have been seeing for a few months now, which is paper shortages that are leading to book shortages. Uh, there was an article in Publishers Weekly, and then the one in the, there was one in the Times recently. A lot of the big holiday books have been hard to find this year because... For a variety of factors. Holiday books? Like, so books that have been selling incredibly well for, for the holidays. Everything from, like, the top novels, like like Lisa Halliday's Asymmetry, or um, to things like, like, I don't think there's been a problem with Michelle Obama's book, but some of the other top biographies and memoirs. And it's partly, it's been a variety of factors, but a couple of them are unusual. One is, early in the year, uh, Bob Woodward's book was being printed in such quantity that... It was tying up all the printers. That's an exaggeration, but it doesn't seem to have been much of one. And But then the bigger problem is paper shortages because a lot of printers were converting to making cardboard for cardboard boxes. The paper suppliers were shifting to make, making um, corrugated cardboard instead of book paper. Finally, Because they could up. make more money at they it? They saw more demand and were making more money. And this, and I'm sure I'm butchering this and a production person could tell me otherwise, but this is the, the basic understanding I've been given of it was... Partly because of so much online commerce, cardboard boxes are in demand, and they could make money with a quick turnaround on that. Because everything needs to be yeah. shipped. And then this meant that when huh. printers started placing, publishers started placing print orders for books, they were having trouble sourcing the paper that was needed, and this slowed things down. Yeah. So it's, it's always something. It never, yeah. <laughs> it, you never settled into to to doing anything, and then never have any problems again. Certainly. Uh, what about shelf space? Limited shelf space. Is there? Uh, do you have to buy it? No. There's. There's certainly. Historically, there have been ways that some, that like Barnes and Noble, for example, has put monetary value on some of their display space, where you through various cooperative programs where you you pay them some money then they allocate different kinds of space differently mm-hmm. but basically day to day your your basic shelf space like just getting a book into a store having it stocked uh, certainly for the indies is is not that way they are really looking to for them the monetary value on that space is how quickly can I turn this around? Exactly, and, yeah. It shouldn't be driven by publishers spending money. It should be driven by people coming in the store yeah. and buying those books. And, and that is more better of those for the out. store anyway yeah. Yeah. in the long run. But uh, And each store has their own sense of what that should be. Again, something like the Seminary Co-op is going to be much more patient with their shelf space and their turn t- turnaround times because part of their whole ethos is deep backlist. They're willing to stock a book even if it's not going to move that often because they think that brings value to their customers in a way that ultimately makes the store successful. Yeah. Um, with a, a smaller store, something like a, a little store like Three Lives in New York, in Greenwich Village, which is just beautiful, a great store, but tiny, I assume they have to turn books really fast. I assume not much is allowed to sit there at all um, because they you just can't bear that in a store that size. But generally, it is a, a matter of Again, if a store is well run, it's of what do my customers want and what are they actually coming to the store looking for and buying. And that's going to vary from market to market. Yeah. Incidentally, I remember the seminary uh, bookstore being underground, and I remember these little lines on the on the floor. <laughs> but they moved. They moved. When yeah. did they move? Um, I'm going to make up a date. Uh, I think probably about probably six or seven years ago, maybe longer. Okay. 
Uh, Close by. They're not they, that far no, away, right? No, they're about a block away into a beautifully designed space that is in a an old um, mid-century building that I believe was initially a dorm, may have been offices for the university. Um, and they've got it's it's open and windowed. There's light, but one of the fun things about it, I was actually on the board of the co-op when this was first being worked on, and to see the architect come in and explain. We're going to set up the shelves in a way that still feels a little labyrinthine on purpose right. because we know that's something our customers value <laughs> yes, is right. this sense of disappearing into the store. And so they did. It's not just big space and rows of shelves. Yeah. It's these angled shelves and, and pathways. and. Do they still warrants. have lines on the floor or no? I, I don't <laughs> think so. Okay. Uh, there's, part of it is because now there's some carpet because they're not in a basement. How do you allocate budget between all these or amongst all these books that you've got to sell in some ways it's not as complicated as you might think uh, and i don't think we're alone in this we don't really do detailed title by title budgeting we it's more it's more broad and then you you set a budget for the department as a whole based on you know a number of factors including what you think your revenue is going to be for that year and what you can support therefore but then what that enables you to do is in theory, give each book what it needs. With Rather than set a, a upper or lower limit on what you're going to spend on a book in terms of human resources, actual staff time, and direct outlays of money, uh, it lets you look at a book and give it the time and support that it needs. That can vary widely, and certainly there are ways in which you can't necessarily control those things as much as you'd like. There are very scholarly books that end up taking up a lot of staff time because of the way the author works, because of the way, because they're just complicated, because something happens where you just need to spend time. Like even something as simple as the author has an event, but it's complicated. You have to wrangle a bookstore and a venue. And, and they, it may be that that book dollar for dollar doesn't pay that back, but it's part of what you're doing as a university press is trying to support all the books that you publish mm -hmm. in the way that makes sense for them. And so while on the one hand, certainly one of my jobs as marketing director is making sure that we, you know, is trying to increase revenue and keep our costs contained at the same time, it's also to support the mission being and the able, mission is the mission is to further and disseminate scholarship. Basically it's a little more detailed than that in our mission statement, mm -hmm. but it is to take, take the products of scholars and scholarship and get them out into the world in as wide a way as possible. Mm. And so part of why we end up, I think, budgeting on a more broad sense is because we are aware of that, that in some sense, our things like our Thoreau biography certainly need the time and support, and we put a ton of labor and thought and, and money behind them to make them work. At the same time, a modest book, or a modest, a modest audience book, a, a work of dense scholarship, if we've decided to publish it, then we want to make sure it gets out there and to as many people as possible. And that, to, Yeah, to everyone who wants or would be interested in reading it. Exactly. Yeah. And, and that takes different channels. It's a, it's a combination of making sure that it gets to the scholarly conferences that are in this field and is on display and for sale there. Mm -hmm. that, that, again, if the author speaks at a, a university department somewhere... That we we're there in some way with a bookseller, a plan to support them and make sure people can get the book and take it home. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's getting it to libraries. It's getting it into library wholesalers so that library academic libraries can buy it. It's getting it into the various library ebook aggregators that buy from us or subscribe to our books so that people can can find it and use it on whatever in whatever format and platform they want to come to this scholarship. It's part of why I like being a university press marketing director as opposed to like a general for-profit publisher marketing director. Not that I look down on that at, at all. There, That would, would be an interesting and difficult job as well. But I genuinely like the mission part of what we do. And I can joke as much as anybody about narrow scholarship and, and you know how, how scholars can lose sight of the world. I also really that's value what they it. should do. Yeah, it's, that's the thing. It's... If we've decided that a book is worthy, then, then I want to get behind it and make sure that we're doing what we can to help it. And mm -hmm. that's, that's exciting and fun. It's something I find 
coming up when I interview people for possible staff jobs is I realize I end up talking sincerely about the mission and about how it really does resonate through everything we do in a way that can sound corny but is legit and and is helpful. It, well, it's also just such a relief to be relieved of this demand to make money all the time everywhere. And, and I think it is a th- it's a thing where we we try to strike a balance. If we if we don't sell enough books, it will be a struggle for all of our books. The goal is to sell enough books that we can can carry books that are more complicated that we can that we can achieve all of our goals at once. The nice thing about it is we're we're an organization and we're in a marketplace that enables us to do that without compromising what we view as the seriousness or quality of our books. Do you, as a marketer, get involved in paying, and maybe the, the press doesn't do this, but paying advances to authors? We do. Uh, one thing I really like about how Chicago works is that the top marketing staff is involved closely in working with our editorial department on what... on on what they're going to publish and how. Not that we say, we certainly don't say, oh, no, you can't publish that. (laughs) That's not our role. Our role is to look at a variety of projects and, and advise on what we, what we think the market for them will be. And, you know, trying to be honestly honestly optimistic, but based on our experience with other books of similar type or the author's track record or the subject, whatever, and so sometimes that does come to, okay, this book is coming to us as a proposal. We're going to need to figure out how much of an advance we, can, we think it can justify. And then competing with other publishers on that front. And that's, that's fun work. It's a fun part of the game. I, I tend to not feel super competitive in general, but this is something where I certainly identify a book that you'd like to publish, and then you really want to make it work. You want to get it from, mm. and keep somebody else from having it. Yeah. Uh, and so that's that's always a really interesting and fun part of the job because you're looking at books pretty early on and you're trying to assess their potential. With the more scholarly ones, it's a, it's a lot more cut and dried in some sense. It's figuring out where does this fit into the field and other books of this type, roughly how many do we tend to sell? And then because you've your peer review process has already helped you establish that this book is good, then that ends up being pretty straightforward. It's with the the general interest books that it becomes a lot more. It's more risky. It's more. Uh, there's a lot more an analysis and even guesswork you have to do. Uh, this industry certainly runs a lot on numbers, but there's still a ton of just gut feeling to it, and that gut feeling is rooted in years of experience if you're doing it right. But it's also yeah, I can I can see this book working, and sometimes you're right, and sometimes you're wrong. But it, with the advance, uh, I've brought this up with a few others uh, recently. The only way you don't pay the advance is if they don't deliver the manuscript. If they don't cover the advance, they still get to keep it, right? Generally, yeah. It my experience, uh, and again, it's not like I've been at at Knopf. Uh, is that you want you are your advance is a bet you're making? Yeah, on you the book. and you and are taking you're the taking risk. The not risk. The, well, the author it, it lessens the risk that the author's taking. Yeah, you're taking a risk that the book won't perform the way you expect it to. And when you're looking at a proposal, that could be, be as simple as the book just doesn't end up being as good as you wanted, mm-hmm. or it could be the book comes in and is great and it just doesn't work. That happens, and it's one of the things that I think is hardest for us to, to take into our thinking because you always want to, if a book doesn't work, you always want to figure out why. You know, why didn't we do as well with that as we expected? Sometimes you can see it. Sometimes it's like, oh, the news cycle just worked against us so badly. This issue had been in the news and then it faded and our book seemed late. Or Sometimes you can't, though. Sometimes it really is just, yeah, it just didn't work. I thought we were going to get this review and this review and they didn't pan out and... You just fail, and that mm. that sucks because it's a, a book is a lot of work on the part of the author and on the part of you and your colleagues, and sometimes it just doesn't work. And having to to internally explain that to yourselves, and then also explain it to the author is mm. is no fun. What about social media? Uh, do you help the author do tweets and 
Instagram and all that sort of stuff? Or Generally, no. It could be that we're, as a university press, we're an outlier there. But I, I don't think I would want to, even if we had the resources to do that. Mm. We'll help with advice. Uh, we will help with guidelines and, and pointers and suggestions. But the whole, my whole experience of social media tells me that it, it, it is a realm where authenticity rules, where voice matters and... Just am, pure promotion yeah, is going to bomb. Yeah, I'm, yeah, and I'm fully comfortable speaking as corporately, in a sense, as the University of Chicago Press about our books and about our authors... I wouldn't be comfortable doing that in the name of an author, and that would come through. Our best, our authors who are best at this understand that every once in a while you'll have an author come to you, and I'm six months before publication, and say, I think I need to get on Twitter. And you're like, okay, that's great, but you should spend time with it. Understand why you're there and what it does and what it can do. Mm. Because otherwise, right, you're just going to be tweeting at people about your book and nobody's going to care. And what can it do then? It can... And you see this, I think, with a lot of fiction, memoir, essay writers. It can help you establish a community of people who care about your book before it even exists and who want to su- it to succeed and want to help it succeed. And But the way you do that is by being yourself online and participating and being part of discussions about books, discussions about issues or communities you might be part of. To my mind, it's like building an audience by building a group of loose friends. Uh, If you've done it right, that's what you end up with. You end up with people who feel what I would say is a genuine personal connection with you and your work because they've watched it and you develop and they've been in on interactions or discussions with you about some of the things that clearly matter to you and they're going to inform your work. If this comes naturally to you, if you're doing it right, they've watched the book develop too. Mm -hmm. At various points, you've checked in about, wow, I turned in a draft. Here's the stack of of pages. I'm tired and I'm excited about this. And they'll be excited too. And so... It's almost almost like the backstory. Yeah. Which is kind of neat. That's why following journalists, for example, is kind of fun because you... Typically, you get the story before everyone else gets it, and plus you get fun, interesting stuff around how it was developed. Yeah, and I think that's why people enjoy podcasts like the Times is the Daily podcast, mm-hmm. because it gives you a sense of how this all works. Mm-hmm. And I think with with authors, you really can make that available to people in a way that's fun and that's interesting. And then there's the other side of it, and this tends to apply more with our authors, if you're a scholar, this is a way to just be out there talking about your subject. And mm-hmm. there's certainly some realms like political science and economics where those fields understood this very quickly and have been they've been very online from early days. The discussions have been strong and interesting there uh, from blogs on to Twitter and the present. And you've developed a number of people who are seen as expert voices, not even so much anymore because they're scholars, although that's the root of their expertise, but because they've been out there talking about this for a long time and people Mm. have come to trust them. Mm. And I think you can do that as a scholar, regardless of what your field is. Obviously, some lend themselves to it more than others, but even something like medieval studies, there's a lot of interest online in medieval stuff, and it doesn't necessarily all have Mm. to be Game of Thrones sword fighting stuff. There's, There's interest in what life was like, and I think that is a a reminder that the online world is broad and it's engaged and that communities there tend to be kind of intense about what they're interested in and your subject may actually be something that that there's a community there you can participate in. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's also the thing too I think of, and this is where I've always enjoyed meeting people I know I've come to meet specifically through Twitter because I think it's a medium that it shows up if you're a jerk. It's hard to hide being a jerk uh, in that realm (laughs) at some point it will come out and so the flip side of that is if you are a nice person and if you enjoy talking to people and engaging with ideas and you can do so as an adult you can get a lot of fun and make connections out of it because it is is a realm that on the one hand certainly it rewards trolling and it rewards jerkish behavior 
but that's not the heart of what it is and can do. And I think for an author, remembering that there's a there's a lot of good out there and a lot of good, interesting discussions and people actually learning from each other in this medium can can be helpful. How has it helped you as specifically as a book marketer? Because I know you're active on Twitter because we follow each other. Uh, I don't know about Instagram or any of the other ones, but uh, less so. But yeah. for me, it most of what I do on Twitter is book related, not usually our books. Yeah. Um, once in a while, certainly one one advantage to that is if you hear from me on Twitter about one of our books, that means I'm genuinely excited about it because I'm, as you'll see from most of my feed, that's not what I'm doing. So it's not an obligation. But it's mostly just in my experience with books and what that has done is introduce me to other readers online. And it's and that's led to, I think Twitter for me started out as just a place to record quotes from what I was reading yeah. and has become that plus interactions with a community of readers and discussions of books and authors I care about and that they care about. Um, I think what's done for me professionally in that realm is it's given me a way as a marketing person for a Midwestern University press who's not in New York and not in trade publishing in this, it, at the trade houses to participate in the broader discussion about books on a, if not, maybe not an equal footing, something close to an equal footing with people who are in those realms. It lets me, it's let me meet uh, you know, other, other publishers, other people from other publishers, meet a bunch of authors, uh, book market or book media people. The number of friendships and acquaintanceships I've developed in this form just by being there talking with people about books we both care about has has been to my mind at least remarkable and has <laughs> enabled me to feel like I'm participating in the public discussion of what books people are reading or caring about in a way that wouldn't have been available to me either as a reader or as a marketer 15 years ago mm -hmm. um, certainly not beyond that off the top of your head if, uh, as a book marketer who who should you know, the top three or four people that a book marketer should follow, aside from yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, that's that's interesting. Okay, um, uh, this might be partly my my own bias as a crime fiction fan, but uh, Sarah Weinman is a very good person to attend to. Partly because she worked for years at Publishers Marketplace, she has an eye on what's actually going on in the business of publishing and is interesting on the in that regard. But she also just reads a ton. She's also just written a book on Nabokov, right? Yes, on, yes. Uh, and which Lolita. Was, was really, really well done mm. and yeah. successful. Kind of like so, the backstory. Yes, yeah. exactly. The, yeah. the real-life kidnapping that she makes a good case, at least kind of triggered the idea for Nabokov, for Lolita, and inspired the, the larger story. Um, so she's really good. Um, I, I will put in a plug for one of my own authors because I knew her on Twitter before this, um, Eve Ewing. Chicago-based scholar of education. She's at the University of Chicago in their education department, and we published her book, Ghosts in the Schoolyard, this fall, which was about Chicago public school closings and racism in the process. She How does is, that help book marketers, though? So she is also a book person. She's a poet. She published a book of poetry with Haymarket. And I think what I love about Eve Ewing on Twitter as a book person is she is kind of engaged with everybody and everything, so she's she's tweeting about books she's read. She's tweeting about political issues, news stories. She's connected with a bunch of people, so you get a sense of what other people are looking at and seeing. Um, so it's not necessarily so much explicitly book marketing as it is. Here is a slice of what's going on on Twitter in a really interesting way, and therefore what's going on in in this part of our, our culture. Sure. Okay. Um, other book marketing people, more specifically. A lot of the people I end up following on Twitter are it's more authors than than anything else. It's yeah. people who have written interesting books and who from there I've gotten a sense of what what their reading tastes are. Um, I think of someone like like Alexander Chi, who wrote a book of essays this year called How to Write an Autobiographical Novel that was really good, and he writes a lot. And this is a way to help me keep up on what where he's written and what his pieces have appeared. But also, he just engages with a lot of, of books and writers in ways that send me off into new directions. And that's a big part of what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Another another place I really enjoy um, is Kirkdale Books in South London it has a Twitter account, and it's they're a tiny little store in Sydenham that is well stocked and have been there for years. But I only get into their store every five years. But I keep up on the kind of things that they think are interesting, which aren't necessarily what they're selling right now. It's it's a wide range of books, past and present, that have caught the proprietor's eye. And it's really fun to get a sense of a store that way. The London Review of Books Twitter account is similar that way in that yeah. it's just goofy fun with also some bookstore content. Uh, Michael Keynes of the TLS is great for very specifically he does quotes from writer's letters and it's a fun thing to do every day just see what he's turned up and so there's a number of kind of ways that twitter for me as a reader expands my reading horizons Mm -hmm. it's a way to keep on the one hand keep your focus on what's going on right now in book culture while also getting away from just oh what's new because it gives me a better picture than i think i've ever had since my bookstore days, maybe, of how people are always reading in two modes. They're reading this new stuff. They're also reading that old thing they never got to or just discovered. And Isn't it? It's a neat way to link the two of them up. Well, you, you actually take photographs of the passages uh, and, and post them on Twitter. Yeah, that's been really... It's fun for me to be able to share what I'm reading that way. My ethos is really simple. It's just if this interested me, it might interest some of you. Yeah, and yeah. being able to to put stuff out there that's caught my eye makes me really happy. I'm social enough in my work life. Being a manager and having a staff of, well, now 28, I guess, means that you're on a lot. You know, you to do a good job as a manager, you need to be attentive and available and and also just calm and careful. And I these are all things I work at, and, and I think I do reasonably well. I guess my staff could tell you otherwise, but I don't think so. But it also... At the end of the week, you've been, in some degree, no matter how authentic that is, you've been performing a little bit. Mm-hmm. And you get to the end of the week, and you just want to sit and read. And one thing I like about Twitter as a reader is it helps me both do that and feel like I'm being social. Because I am. I'm interacting with my my book and my book friends mm-hmm. in a way that, that also lets me I don't know, decompress after a week of, of being on. Yeah, it's kind of a fascinating new way of reading, isn't it? You'll hear every once in a while like uh, people who've spent too much time in Silicon Valley talking about how, you know, we need we need to make books social. We need to make Well, they don't uh, want their kids going anywhere near all this social stuff. Yeah, right? and and this feels to me more like a benign form of of that. This is a way of of basically expanding your book club in a sense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily have to be that we all have to read the same ebook and see each other's notations or whatever that that someone's trying to sell you. It's more just, hey, we can just read and share. Just uh, winding down and staying on this subject, the, 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 the people that you read and that you love, uh, you actually edited a work of... Uh, yeah, since I saw you last, or yeah. since we did, since we did this last, yes, I edited a volume of nonfiction writings by Donald Westlake, the crime writer. And, and the interesting thing is that Chicago published it. Yeah, so you got to see what it was like from another side. It was really fun uh, from the stage of writing a proposal because, and I'm reading book proposals all the time in my job, so it was fun to sit down and do that, all the way through to publicizing it. Uh, did you actually go to book, uh, writers' festivals or to that extent, or, we or did, not? readings? I guess we you did, did a couple events. We did a big event at our house, which was oh, fun, okay, and, okay. And, uh, and then we did. I did a, an event at the Mysterious Bookshop in New York, where Abby Westlake, Don's widow, and uh, Lawrence Block, who was kind enough to write a foreword, and I stood up and talked about the book, That's and great. it was great fun. But yeah, it was a it was a pleasure throughout both. In the starting point, just simply because I think as a reader, you don't often get to give back to an author who's given you so much. And Donald Westlake is one of my favorite writers. And to be able to go to his family and say, I think there's enough disparate nonfiction writing he did in his career. 
I, that I think we can put together a book and it'll be good and then people will enjoy it and they'll find out about all this writing he did they don't know about. Plus you've got a natural audience for it. Exactly. Yeah. And to be able to do that and I was grateful his family was very supportive of this idea. Abby let me and my friend Ethan Iverson who is a Westlake fan and as knowledgeable about his work as anyone come to their house and spend two days going through the files and just pulling out pieces that then formed the backbone of the book. What a thrill for It was you. great, right, yeah. to go through the files of yeah. one of your favorite writers. We had a, a fantastic time. So just to be able to do that and then at the end of it say, hey, in thanks for all the great, all the pleasure he gave me over the years, you know, I helped make this thing for you. And then to get to do that with your colleagues. So to know that the book's in good hands, that it's going to look and feel great, it's going to be edited well. Uh, there was a point where my colleague who did the actual copy editing caught an error that had made it through when an interview had been published in another book years before. She had caught an error in the name of the town that Jim Thompson was born in, Anadarko, Oklahoma. <laughs> and I was able to compliment her and say, hey, Kelly, you, yeah, the last person who edited this a few years ago to a different publisher didn't catch that. Mm -hmm. That kind of thing was really fun. And then to be able to even on this, just the ridiculous level of going into a meeting at the New York Times book review and sit down with their editor and say, oh, yeah, by the way, this next galley I'm handing you is mine. <laughs> you know, that that it's leads to them looking at you differently, at least briefly. It, <laughs> it's, it's amusing. A newfound and, respect. Yeah. And you have to be, obviously, you have to be careful with that because you also can't be that person in the office who's asking for too much from your colleagues. You have to be careful to yeah. ask yourself at all times, am I acting like I would for any other book? Okay, yes, then I'm fine. But <laughs> but it was a ton of fun. I, and what worked the best is for the marketing side of it? What worked best for that book? Single, mo single most effective thing for it was actually a Wall Street Journal review by Bill Crystal. He he was a Westlake fan going way back, and the journal it got the daily review in the journal which is one of the best spots for selling books in all of American media because it, it's the only review in the daily paper and it gets a full column with an image of the cover and people just see it and buy. And it was a great review. So uh, reviews in newspapers it really, are still yeah, really the does number make a difference. one. So hmm. that was the mo like the time we saw the biggest immediate sales bump. Right. But the bigger th thing overall was simply... We got to take advantage of the groundwork that we and I had laid over, at that point, six years republishing Westlake's Parker novels. You know, the community of fans knew me because they knew I had been involved in that, and they knew... Com that community, what, online community? Mostly, yeah. yeah. It, yeah. Was, it was being able to reach out to people I knew online who were fans and who I knew could tell other people about it. Some of it was things like there was a, there's a guy... Uh, Trent Reynolds, who ran a site called The Violent World of Parker, where he, Parker fans went to read and talk about the books. So I knew I could reach out to him. And having identified where to find the audience beforehand, because we had done all this work, and one of the great things about genre fiction in particular, and crime fiction, is this is a community that wants to help. People want to tell other people about the books they've liked, mm -hmm. because they appreciate that when other people do it for them. Mm -hmm. And so if you've got something good to offer you can count on a lot of support and just word of mouth spreading of, of news, which you can't always necessarily with, with other genres. I think genre fiction and crime fiction in particular are really good that way. Mm -hmm. And it's a community that's very supportive and that's, that's super satisfying to see in action. Just finally, uh, you told me you're very excited about this new position. What are you going to do with it? Yeah. Uh, first, I'm going to hire a replacement for myself in my old position so that I won't be doing two jobs. That's step one. Honestly, at this point, it's all still pretty speculative. My boss had been in the role for 23 years, and I really enjoyed working for her and got I learned so much from her. What's, I'm taking, what's the number one thing you learned from her? Um, it, to, to a large degree, it was, it was hire people you know can do the job and let them do the job. It was I, at her retirement. So it wasn't could, marketing related necessarily. No, it was more management related in some okay. sense. Um, yeah. and I think on the marketing related side, it, it probably would be just that it ultimately does come down to the content and the book. Like if the book's not good, it's not going to work. And if the book's good, it may still not work, but it's going to have a lot better shot. But yeah, I think it was just knowing that there was a reason you hired someone 
and that what your job is as their manager is to give them some direction and some guidance. And certainly if they are not doing their job, you have to deal with it. But if they're doing their job, your job is to help them and support them and, you know, kind of just make sure that you and they are in agreement on goals and then let them do it. Yeah, let them blossom. Yeah. And you as a manager and you as an organization will be better off the more you can do that. I've got a, a staff of experienced people and I figuring out what we want to do next, what we might want to do differently, what things we may not have been trying or maybe tried in the past and maybe should go back to thinking about again. Um, that'll be the fun part over the next six months, two years, 10 years, whatever. One of the nice things about it is it's, you know, I'm looking at it with a long time horizon. My plan is to be doing this for a long time. And we have been around for 125 years and we're not going anywhere. And it's not like the market is going to stay static or get easier. So it should continue to be challenging and interesting. But it also, ultimately, it's still every day working with books and authors. And that's that's why, why I'm willing to put in the time and energy and care about it. And we can follow your progress on Twitter. Uh, some of it anyway. Yeah, some of it anyway, certainly. And, and through, you can keep an eye on the University of Chicago Press Twitter account to see what's going on with us as an organization. And so what are those two? Yours? That, so mine is just Levi Stahl, one word. And then University of Chicago Press is U Chicago Press, all, all jumbled together. So yeah, and you can keep, keep an eye on what we're doing. We'll be doing some fun books and some interesting books and hopefully creative things on the marketing side too. If not, you can tell me about it. You know how to find me. <laughs> well, thanks so much for uh, letting me find you. Thank you. It's been uh, fun. Levi, it's been fun, yes. Yeah. Levi Stahl is the new director of marketing for the University of Chicago Press based in Chicago.